Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Academic Access. Uh, I know we've had a very long interim before we could get another session going in, but I am incredibly honored and very privileged um, to have a Dr. John, Professor John Headley Brook as my guest for this week's show. Uh, Dr. John, Professor John, welcome to Academic Access. Well, thank you, Shirav. It's a delight to be here. Right. Uh, Professor John, uh, because um, we usually try and introduce people's profiles before we get to the topic at hand, uh, can you just introduce us like, um, you know, how did you get into the field of science and religion? You're, you know, you're, you're a leading expert on the history of the topic, right? Um, and I don't know, like, did you, did, did the light bulb come on one day? It's like, yep, I'm just going to history and I want to zoom in particularly on science and religion. Like, how did that happen? Oh, well, it is actually quite a complicated story, but we, as with, you know, many people, it really starts with school, because my favourite science subject at school was chemistry, and that's what I read when I went up to university. Um, so on the science side, I'd always found chemistry particularly tantalizing. Even as a young child, I used to see chemistry sets in the shops. And I used to think, wouldn't it be wonderful to own one of those and to experiment for myself on all these colors and smells and bangs and all the things that make chemistry so interesting. Mm -hmm. So a large part of my interest in the sciences really goes back to the fact that we had a wonderful chemistry teacher at school who inspired a, a love of the subject. Right. Uh, on the religious side, um, it's not quite such a straightforward story. My family was not particularly religious, but I became interested in religion also during my school years partly because we had a history master who used to lead Bible study classes. And I used to go along out of interest to those. We also had a remarkable, a remarkable Methodist um, teacher at the school who was also actually teaching chemistry, though at a more junior level. And he taught two courses that were particularly distinctive. One was for, uh, for a general paper, whereby we discussed all kinds of things. And the exam for that consisted in writing an essay on almost anything could come up. But also, he taught something that was to play a critical role in, in my academic life. And that is, we had a course on the history and philosophy of science. Right. And what was great about that, um, and I think other students at school found the same, was that gave one an opportunity to ask questions, um, to use one's imagination, uh, to break out of seeing science simply as a very rigid and rather dull collection of facts and techniques. Right. So I was exposed to the history and philosophy of science at school, which meant when I went to university and had the opportunity uh, eventually to leave the study of, of chemistry, which I enjoyed hugely, but I appreciated even more the joy of looking at the history of science and the cultural implications of science and the importance of those implications for religion. Mm. So it was really during my university years that I developed a greater interest in the history of science and began to shift my academic interests away from the laboratory and into the library. And it's quite a significant transformation, of course. Mm. Right. So when you made that transformation, did you face any obstacles? You know, um, like right now today, it's very difficult to hop from one field to another. I mean, there are many obstacles nowadays. Back then, um, uh, do you, was it easy to kind of move from, you know, the what are quote unquote natural sciences to the softer sciences? Actually, 
I think that depended on which university at which you were studying. I was extremely fortunate because at Cambridge, uh, one could study something. Uh, I was studying the natural sciences uh, for two years, but you could complete your honours degree by doing something quite different in mm. one's third year. And that was so much part of the way the structure of the Cambridge a uh, degree was set up that lots of people changed and switched to all kinds of things um, from mathematics to economics, um, mm. from the sciences to to the arts. And it was it was really quite marvelous in that respect. It could be a terrific liberation. And uh, it would be it would be more difficult to do that now. I think that is certainly true. All right. Okay. So um, now, when it came to actually you know doing your research, did you focus on the science of religion? Sorry, the, the history of science of religion uh, in a particular you know period across the world. I mean, how did you go about navigating this territory? Okay, my research in the history of science was unsurprisingly in the history of chemistry, and right. so my interests in science and religion were a kind of hobby on the side, but a serious academic interest nonetheless. And during the years that I was studying the history of science with more intensity, I became particularly interested in the literature on the Darwinian revolution, mm -hmm. as it's sometimes called. And my work in the history of chemistry was also on the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So that meant that although I had a, an interest in how science had developed in Europe, particularly over the last 500 years or so, insofar as I began to build up a specialism, it was in the 19th century. Uh, so that was the particular period where I would continue to to work. And actually, for most of my uh, career, that is the century that I probably know best. Though strangely, um, I'm often asked to write on other centuries that I don't know so well. And I think because I don't know them so well, I probably write more clearly and in ways that other people um, can, can understand. But the, the 19th century, of course, is immensely rich because that's the period when the sciences become professionalized, much more specialized than they had been in the past. And that <clears throat> has implications for their relationship with religion in that period. Right. right. And, and, and when you're researching into this topic, right, I mean, um, the very first chapter of your book that you just published um, in 2014, that, I mean, it showed that there were a lot of careful assumptions you were kind of unpacking as you went along in terms of how historians sometimes push back certain ideas that are so taken as for granted in modernity, but when in the past, they weren't really there. So there seems to be a bit of a mismatch sometimes. Can you give us more insight into that? I think that's a very crucial point you've made, uh, Shoabi. It's perfectly true that much of the literature, certainly that I experienced back in the 1970s, um, was probably defective because it looked at the past through the categories of the present. And that's something which doesn't really work very well when you're looking at the the impact and the relationship between what we call science and religion. You know, I think it's it's very important to recognize that in an important sense, those two words operate today in a relatively recent sense. I mean, there was a time when science, scientia, meant knowledge. Um, it meant an organized body of knowledge. Uh, rather different from the specialized experimental science of today. So in earlier centuries, theology it could be a science, even the queen of the sciences, because it, it had the most important subject uh, of all, which is uh, thinking about the nature of God and God's relationship to the world.
Right. So when we think of a figure like Isaac Newton, for example, um, his great book on the mathematical principles of natural philosophy, it used that word, or well, those two words, natural philosophy, in the title, which covered rather more than our modern specialized science. And it enabled Newton to say, for example, um, that to study the nature of God's relationship to nature was very much part of the business of natural philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wouldn't find a professor of physics, I think, today uh, saying that uh, to study God's relationship to nature was part of the business of modern mm -hmm. physics. I mean, they might speculate uh, when they're off their guard from time to time. But you, you, you see the point, the categories that apply now uh, applied rather differently in, in the past. And even the word religion, as Peter Harrison has shown, uh, he was very eloquent on this topic when you were interviewing him. Um, even the word religion really has a different focal meaning um, than, than it did in, in earlier centuries. Mm -hmm. So we do have to be very careful about reading the past through our categories today. And, and actually, perhaps I could make one other point there, which is that many scientists, when they write the history of science, unsurprisingly, are interested in how their particular science has developed over the years. And there's a great temptation to read the past as a kind of preparation for the present. Yeah. It becomes a story of triumph over ignorance. Uh, it becomes a story of the good guys against the villains. <laughs> uh, well, exactly so. I mean, that that's the perfect term to describe it. But actually, that way of doing history rather plays into the hands of those who like to see some kind of perpetual warfare or conflict between science and religion, because it's the clerics who are always the villains and it's the scientists uh, who are always the heroes, particularly those who got the answers right. Um, so that way of looking at the history of science, that rather kind of triumphalist, rather narrow, uh, way of, of seeing the way that um, things have simply converged on our present view of the world. It's inhibiting because it doesn't encourage a critical look at contemporary science, for example. In my teaching over a long career, I've always been struck by the way in which science students, when confronted with the history of science, very often have a kind of eureka moment themselves when they suddenly realize that most of the theories that have been put about during the history of science turn out to be false. And it raises the question in their minds, and correctly so, I think, do we take too much to gr for granted uh, when we think of the correctness of all our contemporary science and the, the incorrectness of, of all past science? And of course there's been progress. Of course there's been the refutation of many of these earlier, more primitive ideas. But we do have to be careful, I think, uh, about placing modern science on such a pedestal that we can't bring any kind of critical perspectives to bear on it. Right. And on this point, then, how did the whole conflict thesis start about then? I mean, if you're saying this is a, a relatively new development, I mean, what are the seeds of this thought? Is it to do with, you know, modernity, secularism? I mean, how would you go about answering that question? All those things. I mean, it's actually quite a difficult question to answer, and it requires careful historical analysis. 
it would be a great mistake to say that the con the idea of conflict between science and religion never even arose until the late 19th or early 20th centuries. I think during the French Enlightenment, for example, you can see ways in which new forms of science could be um, turned to advantage in attacks on religion, particularly on the, the dogmatism of the Roman Catholic Church, if one is thinking about the French Enlightenment in, in particular. Um, so what one ha has to see, I think, is that many new ideas in philosophy and science did lend themselves to more radical extension when they were then manipulated in ways to embarrass traditional religious creeds. Mm -hmm. So the story actually does go back quite a long way. I think in the 17th century, you can begin to see signs of tension, uh, some anxiety and apprehension among clergy who are actually involved in doing science, but they they sometimes give the impression that they're not quite sure whether they should be devoting their time uh, to this enterprise. It's a bit self self-indulgent and and it could lead to to problems so i think you know you can keep going backwards in time and finding the seeds as you put it of the conflict but in terms of articulating a major historical grand narrative about the relations between science and religion then i think you are looking to the early 19th century with the work of Auguste Comte, again in France, um, but then in, in the Anglophonic world towards the end of the 19th century, two figures who are always mentioned um, are John William Draper, uh, who wrote on the conflict between religion and science, uh, a very vigorous and and very um, unsympathetic attack on the way he thought the Roman Catholic Church had been hostile to science. But you should notice, um, even in Draper's work, that he's not hostile to all religion. Um, in fact, he claims that the Protestant churches have actually been, you know, very supportive of science. And he says Islam as an alternative religion altogether um, was more sympathetic to the study of, of nature. So the idea that there is something essential about religion and something essential about mm -hmm. science that leads to an inevitable conflict. I don't think you even get that with, with Draper. And I don't think you get it either um, with A.D. White, who published his book in the, the 1890s on the warfare between science and theology. Uh, it, it, it's, I mean, that's a very strong word to use, that mm. science and theology have been at, at war. But White is very careful to say that he's not attacking religion. What he's attacking is dogmatic theology, which mm. gets in the way of the freedom of scientific thought. So we have to make some quite fine distinctions when we talk about this. Uh, and I, I think we, we were mentioning a few moments ago, one of your visitors next week um, is, is going to argue that the, the, the real conflict thesis, that there is some essential conflict between science and religion, um, is, is an early 20th century phenomenon. Mm. So it's an interesting story. Mm. And, and one has to invoke some nuances, I think, uh, to get the story straight. Right. And in your opinion, uh, Dr. Brooke, because I think, as you know, and even uh, Professor Peter Harrison, I mean, your works were very instrumental in the master's program in, the, uh, in Edinburgh's Science of Religion. I mean, I took that program, and that's where I got to know of your work and his work. And um, one of the things that I, I remember Peter Harrison mentioning in his videos is the idea that new atheists seem to instrumentalize a very idiosyncratic or a very um, self-serving reading of history 
to kind of mark out that, you know, there has been this boiling tension since the dawn of science, right? And they root it all the way back to kind of Galileo. Um, now, I have two questions in this regard. Number one, uh, I mean, to what extent is, is the idea that there is a conflict um, a forced question rather than something that's actually there? And if it is a forced question, then um, in terms of trying to understand it in light of modernity, what were some, not necessarily exhaustive, but some of the forces that led to kind of that brewing apparent tension that's become so uh, accepted in the wider public today? That's a fascinating question. I mean, the second half of it that you just <laughs> articulated, because I think that takes us into the realm of thinking about the way wider social attitudes and mm -hmm. political movements towards what we now call mo mo modern secular cultures. What have been the main springs of, of those? And I would have to say, I think, that one has to be careful about invoking science itself as the main spring of those social and political transformations. Uh, I think what might be called the secularization of religion, um, this is something which in some ways um, did start when scientific and religious ideas were kind of fused together as they often were uh, in the 17th century. There's a fine book by Amos Funkenstein where he talks about uh, theology and science from the Middle Ages to the 17th century. And his argument is, is that science itself didn't emerge simply as a force in society separating itself from religion or from theology. It was actually rather the reverse, um, that scientific thinkers in the 17th century particularly um, were prone to presenting their scientific ideas in theological language in theological terms. So you do get what he calls an unprecedented fusion of science and theology in the 17th century. Now, it would be perfectly possible then to say that that is one of the first stages in, in a broader secularization of knowledge. But when it comes to the secularization of society, which is is critical, uh, of course, if we're talking about public attitudes to these questions. Um, then I think we have to look rather more closely at the kind of reasons people have for dissenting from religion. And those religions can be many. But what's interesting is that some of the research that's been done on this seems to indicate that even some of the leaders of secular thought have not claimed that it was science that robbed them of their faith. There were all kinds of other things they would mention. Um, obviously, dogmatism of the churches was something uh, that could cause a, a lot of anxiety and, and trouble. Um, sometimes if one's looking at the Christian tradition, in 19th century thinkers would say that reading the Bible had actually robbed them of their faith because they encountered images of God, which they thought were highly anthropomorphic um, and, and, and therefore beneath the dignity of, of an omniscient, omnipotent being. So there are many, many reasons. I think in the 19th century, uh, scientists themselves would often refer not to their science, um, but to certain religious teachings that they thought were unacceptable to a modern mind. And Darwin is a very interesting example of that. We tend to think that he must have lost his faith through the science, through the theory of evolution. But that really isn't true. The mm. thing that he mentions in the autobiography as having uh, largely, but not exclusively, inspired his um, agnosticism about the, 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 the Christian tradition, 
was simply um, what he thought to be an immoral doctrine that um, those who could not believe, those who did not subscribe to the, to the Christian faith, were somehow doomed. And he knew that his grandfather, his brother Erasmus, um, and indeed his father were free thinkers who on that doctrine were destined for some kind of eternal hellfire. And Darwin says that is a damnable doctrine. Mm. So there is that recoiling against some of the morality which free thinkers perceived in religious ideas. I think that could be quite a significant consideration as well. Mm -hmm. We could look at a whole range of other things. Um, it depended on what you read. The 18th century deist Thomas Paine, um, he writes a scathing critique um, of the, the theology of his time. Uh, and that's a book which actually encouraged people who read it to have second thoughts perhaps about the religious teachings that they had imbibed from their background. Mm. So it's, it's a fascinating story. It's a whole range of interlocking things and it depends critically on which country you're looking at and indeed which religion you are looking at. And I think this is a critical point where history can be valuable because it warns us against oversimplification. Right. Uh, I think uh, this is an interesting point that you hit. So, um, I mean, my personal interest is mostly to do with the interface of thoughts between Christianity and Islam. That is a central part of my own research. But also how uh, the maybe the, the the relationship between science and Islam is is very different to maybe how it occurred in the West or in the Christendom, right? So, uh, to what extent do you believe that there is a whole scope um, of research that is still I think uh, that needs digging up for other traditions? Do you think that that is already happening right now in academia, or there's still a lot a long way to go forward before we can say anything for sure? There's a long way to go. Um, and you're doing a great job, if, if I may say. Um, I greatly enjoyed what you've written on, on this. It, it is, I think, a critical area because even where you find similarities, shall we say, between Islamic doctrine um, and uh, a theistic position coming from the European, the Christian tradition, even when there seem to be similarities, the way those doctrines are interpreted within each religion is often not quite the same. Yeah. And it requires a pretty sensitive mind sometimes to spot the, the contrast. I mean, I, I, I'm particularly struck by one of the contrasts you yourself have drawn, actually, that in the Christian West, the way what we call natural theology was developed. And this is where one looks to sources other than scripture for uh, what one might infer about the character of, of God. Um, those arguments from natural theology for the existence of, of God, they have a certain parallel within Islam. But when you look more closely, um, as I think you emphasize, there is a contrast, and, and that is that within the Christian West, there is anxiety about why a good God, a God who is infinitely good, should allow suffering in the world. And you've pointed out that within the kind of Islamic natural theology, if we can just use that phrase for a moment, the question of, of why Allah should allow suffering in the world just doesn't arise because... In one school of thought, yeah. yeah. In one school of thought. Yeah. yeah. So um, these kind of subtleties are, are quite important, I think. Mm. Let's just take a, an, another example. Uh, I've been doing a little bit of work recently on 
attitudes towards environmental ethics within the Christian tradition and within Islam. And again, there are major similarities between the, the two. But I think there is no doubt within the Christian West, the notion that uh, humanity has somehow a God-given right to investigate nature in such a way that one restores a certain power or dominion of humanity over nature. Um, that sense even of conquering nature, that you don't find to the same extent within Islam. That you can find similar anthropomorphic ideas, um, but you don't find quite the same stress on what Bacon called uh, putting nature on the rack and, yes. and, and discovering through controlled experimentation how, how nature works. So you have a very good project, if I may say so, uh, and there is a lot more work to be done. Right. And uh, uh, Professor John, you know, since you've gone through this, I don't know, for like several decades, right? In terms of people who are trying to look at the investigation of science and their own particular religious tradition, um, it, of course, there is um, what I like to call sometimes a terminological obstacle or a stitching exercise between the current vocabulary in academia and, the, you know, what their tradition has to say. And of course, there's not necessarily always a clear correspondence of terms, right? And no matter, sometimes whenever you try to stitch a word, you may either lose something or you may add something that's not, or that not may, may not be there. How do you go about, I mean, resolving those kind of dilemmas as a historian? Well, I think all one can do really mm -hmm. is study more closely how language has, you, has been used. Mm -hmm. And I think one in, in that way can see how significant changes have have occurred um, it's difficult to say much more than that with without a, a more concrete example um, but perhaps I mean let, let's just take a, a very interesting example perhaps two keywords like evolution and creation yeah. uh, now these feature very prominently in popular literature on science and religion, as, as you know. Um, but those words have gone through many transformations of meaning in a more elite culture. Uh, and, and I think this is rather crucial. It's also rather sad, for example, that you can have people saying they believe that the world depends for its existence on some transcendental, transcendental power, a creator, um, that they, they can say that. Um, but if you do say that, you're liable to be interpreted by any rational, secular, modern scientist as being some kind of creationist. Mm -hmm. And then the word creationist assumes a rather special meaning because the word is so often used these days to refer to a kind of fundamentalist either who takes the Holy Quran or who takes the Bible uh, literally in what it has to say about creation. Whereas, in fact, uh, the belief that the world in its entirety and it, in its endurance depends on some ulterior power, that is a very different philosophical proposition from imagining some kind of intervening God who's created each living species separately. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about Darwin is that he was very clear on, on that point. I think he felt that there was all kinds of popular misunderstanding because of the way the words had become domesticated in, in a kind of popular literature. Whereas he regards the, the ultimate question, whether the world is completely self-explanatory or whether there has to be some ulterior transcendent power. He says 
the belief in that transcendent power is something that has been shared by many of the great minds um, who have thought about these issues. So that would just be one rather interesting example uh, with the word creation, how the word gets thrown around, um, abused in all kinds of ways, and it requires much more careful analysis, I think. And the word evolution, uh, of course, which is a word that Darwin hardly ever used at all, um, because its contemporary meaning at that time was to refer to the, the development of an embryo, the development of a fetus, the evolution um, of the offspring within the womb. Uh, that's what evolution meant. Uh, what was discussed in Darwin's day was often called the transformation or the transmutation of, of species. The mm -hmm. language is critically important. And I think this is where the historian in um, collusion, often correctly so, with the philosopher uh, can, can actually help. Mm -hmm. Right. And so on that point, uh, Professor John, I mean, you've given us a, a fantastic tour about some of the exercises that historians do in trying to understand these, these trends. Um, uh, there is to some extent a necessity to uh, look at the interface of history and also the philosophy of science, right? So how is that interface developing in academia? I think those who operate as professional historians or philosophers of science um, will probably take rather different views on that. Right. There was a time, certainly, and it was the time when I was doing my graduate work in, in Cambridge, when the history and philosophy of science was regarded as basically one subject. Oh, uh, yes. Wow. Um, you know, one had a department of the history and philosophy of science. And that meant that the way the history of science was done was often in a way that made it subservient to philosophical interests. So mm -hmm. one looked for historical case studies that would illuminate a contemporary philosophical problem. And in that kind of way, the two subjects were brought very close together. When I say the two subjects now, of course, I mean the history and, and the, the philosophy. Um, I think they came together in one subject in other ways too, that philosophers would clarify what they felt the critical issues were if one wanted to give a kind of in-depth account of what scientific investigation, uh, scientific experimentation, uh, the theory of the confirmation of scientific theories. If one were interested in those deeply philosophical questions, um, then to be sure the historian could help out by looking to see at what stage in the development of science some of those issues suddenly took on a a high profile when they might not have done so before. So in the 1960s, I think, uh, and early 70s, certainly in Cambridge, there was a subject called the history and philosophy of science. Wow. Gradually, because it didn't happen overnight, but gradually during the ensuing decades, there became a much clearer split between the kinds of questions philosophers ask and the kind of questions historians ask. And the split occurred in part, I think, maybe mainly because historians of ideas began to realize, and, and that of course included scientific ideas, historians of science began to realize that you had to place the science in some kind of context just writing about the history of ideas as a philosopher might um, didn't properly capture science as a cultural product mm -hmm. as, as a cultural artifact in society and so 
ideas emanating from the social sciences, I think, really became uh, much more significant for the way the history of science was practiced. And that led to a certain um, distancing from mainstream philosophical interests. And I think at that time, uh, what was often said was that there was some kind of battle going on uh, between the internalists and the externalists. The new style of history of science was one that looked at all the fascinating influences in society that could affect the development of science and how new ideas were received. Um, the the internalist were the the more traditional uh, works in the history of science pursued by people who were more interested simply in the technical details of the way a science like chemistry had developed, for example, and maybe as I did for quite a long time, focused very much on problems in the philosophy of chemistry. Uh, the first the first paper I ever published was actually on Friedrich Wöhler's synthesis of urea in 1828, which was often said to have sounded the death knell of vitalism, the idea that there was some animistic, some vital principle in living things. And I tried to show that that story is a myth. Uh, it's a kind of foundation myth of the science of organic chemistry. So this battle between the internalists and the externalists and the way the externalists move more in the direction of a social history of science, that led to a greater separation between the history and philosophy of science. Now I do, of course, recognize today uh, that there are various factors that have brought the two closer together again. And I think that's actually a very good thing mm -hmm. because the historians do have much to learn from the sharpness of thinking that come with a, uh, an education, a literacy in, in philosophy. Um, and I think the philosophers maybe do have something to learn from what uh, historians have, have said, simply about the pluralism and the complexity of problems. Let me just illustrate that for a moment. Um, I used to attend conferences when I was a graduate student and, and afterwards. And when I was following what was my hobby initially of looking at the relations between science and religion, I would go to conferences dominated by philosophers who often had papers to present with titles like, what is the of the relationship between science and religion? It's a very good philosopher's question. For a historian, that's a pretty crazy question because um, you know, there have, there have been a multifarious number of ways of talking about the relationship between science and religion. The notion that there is somehow one privileged way in, in which you can grab this whole topic and sort it out for posterity, just gradually, to me anyway, uh, came to seem rather naive. And I became much more interested in the diversification of what one could say about the relations between scientific and religious thinking. So what interested me, for example, in the impact of Darwin's work was to look at the great diversity of reactions to his theory of natural selection. Instead of simply thinking, uh, along comes Darwin with his theory of evolution, that's the end of natural theology, uh, that's the end of creationism. Uh, and yet, that latter view you still do find as, as, as a kind of hallowed assumption among those who come to the subject armed with their philosophical critiques of natural theology. So one of the things that pleases me now is that with so much more work being done 
on the way the history and philosophy of science can be used in science education. Um, I, I'm thinking of journals like Science and Education, for example, which explore these issues in great depth. What I see happening there is that there are deep and, and fascinating papers on the way the philosophy of science and the history of science can come together to help to educate young scientists out of a mindset um, which suggests that there's no room for imagination or creativity mm. in science. And, and it, it's a great sadness to me that one of the defects of a, a kind of customary science education has been that it tends to put the lid on imagination and science can become a subject that you learn by rote and a set of techniques that you learn by rote. And I think, frankly, science can become very dull and, and unexciting if it's actually taught in, in that way. So the history and philosophy of science do come together in the context of science education, where I think they have a key role to play. I, I don't know if you know this about me, Professor John, but I'm actually a chemical engineer who's transitioning into science and religion. And I completely agree with your observation that it can get so dull and you just become this automation that just tries to solve problems without kind of looking at this complexity that, that the environment brings with it. Yes, I mean, I do actually still feel very passionately about that. Um, and it's the one thing I really regretted about my own science education, even in one of the finest universities in the world. Um, I was struck by the fact that there was something rather mechanical and mechanistic about it. Um, now, there was something very often beautiful one could appreciate in the way a well-crafted experiment had been designed. I remember the, the way in which radioactive isotopes were being used to elucidate metabolic pathways in the biochemical sciences when I was uh, uh, studying the, those particular sciences. Um, beautiful, I mean, one would use the word beautiful. And, and this element of science is, is you know, what can so easily get lost. I've recently been reading a lovely book by Tom McLeish. Uh, it's called The Poetry and Music of Science. It's all about the way in which scientific creativity in many ways does actually mirror the kind of creativity you would find in music or in literature. And of course, there were great scientists whose understanding of the cosmos was illuminated through musical analogies. Newton is one, Johannes Kepler, a great astronomer, had this wonderful idea that the planets as they go around the sun all emit a musical note, actually a note that changes as the velocity of the planet changes. Um, and so you do get the sense of a harmony of, well, not the spheres in Kepler's case, because he, of course, uh, introduced the idea of elliptical orbits, but that Pythagorean notion um, of, of a correlation between mathematical and musical harmony, which could be used to analyze the workings of the real world. Mm. Um, it's a very important kind of correlation. So I'm all for imagination in science um, and all for recognizing a creativity that I think easily gets lost if we just follow the humdrum routine of learning why this particular uh, thing behaves in the way it, it does. What I really missed in my own scientific education was that we would be presented with a scientific theory, 
and you would write it down, you write down the mathematics and you would then learn it and you might learn how to apply it. The thing you were never told was why that theory was so important. What did it do for the sciences when it was first articulated? How was it used or how was it actually not used? There are many fascinating stories of scientific innovations which were not used at the time, but which were subsequently rediscovered many, many years later. Wonderful example, uh, which you'll appreciate as a, a chemist, um, Avogadro's hypothesis, which was proposed in 1811. Um, that hypothesis was largely ignored for 40 or well, 40 years at least, possibly 50 even until it assumed a new importance when chemistry moved into a new three-dimensional phase. Mm. So that critical distinction between the atom and the molecule that Avogadro put forward, um, it took a long time before other scientists cottoned on to its great value. Yeah. These kind of issues make history I think really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just adding to the, the discussion of education, um, I mean, as a science teacher, so I teach chemistry, uh, organic chemistry and physics at my university. Um, even the way the syllabus seems to be scripted is, is the way it's a, it's a very non-historical way in the sense that uh, even the little history that's mentioned at the very beginning, it's kind of a very linear uh, progress uh, way of shaping things. So you have this guy, he expanded on this guy, he expanded on this guy, and there we go without looking at the errors that people made along the way, the exhaustive measures that people did along the way. And I think it gives students in particular a very, very naive view of how science works. I mean, do you, yeah. would you agree with that? Entirely, 110%, because it, it, streamline, it streamlines the history in such a way that it gives the impression that the truth automatically comes out in yeah. science. Once you've got the right guy, to formulate it. Uh, what it doesn't recognize is the way in which what we acknowledge was important science today often emerged from controversy between scientists. There's, there's no automatic self-authenticating truth. Scientists have to fight for, for their truth in a way. Um, you know, they, they have to convince other scientists that their particular interpretation of, of their experimental work is correct, that it has important, that it's fertile, that it can be applied to other questions. So um, yes, that streamlining of history, which goes along with the idea that scientific knowledge simply accumulates over time. And that's the thesis that Thomas Kuhn, in a very famous book, uh, taking us back to the 1960s, uh, Kuhn wrote his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, which caused quite a sensation and had considerable impact in the social sciences as well. But his great critique was of that linear accumulation view, which he mm -hmm. illustrates with reference to you know, the first chapters of many scientific textbooks who give you that potted history, that kind of chronicle of who were the great guys who got this sorted, you know, that kind of, of history and who were the bad guys uh, who simply didn't get it. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that really is a travesty of the history of science. Right. Uh, so, Professor John, uh, we're about to uh, come to an end of our session, but I just wanted to ask you two questions before we head it off. Um, the first question is, what are the best books you'd recommend to people who are interested in the history of science religion? That's the first question. Right. I think an excellent book to read is one edited by my friend and colleague Ronald Numbers. It's called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About 
science and religion. And that's a great book because it explodes 25 myths that are widespread in literature on science and religion. Uh, what's more, every chapter is written by somebody who really knows what they're talking about. In other words, by a historian who has made a special study of that topic. Also, each chapter is only 3,000 words. You weren't allowed any more. So it's actually great bedtime reading. You can explode a myth every night for a month before you go to sleep. So that's one book I really do recommend. It's accessible, but it's also very learned. So I would strongly recommend that. There are fine scholarly books that look at um, the literature on science and religion. I'm even wondering whether I might dare to mention one that would be of interest, I think, to people who come from the different religion, religious backgrounds. Ronald Numbers and I edited a book which came out in 2011 called Science and Religion Around the World. And that is, is a more advanced book than the one I've just mentioned. But it does devote a whole series of chapters to the way the culture of science was evaluated within a particular religious tradition. Mm. So there's a chapter on science in early Islam, there's one on science and modern Islam. There's a chapter on uh, science and early Christianity, um, one on the modern debates, and there's one on Judaism in both more ancient treatments and, and in the modern world. And that includes chapters on free thought, um, those who didn't want anything to do with religion at all. There's even a chapter devoted to, to that, which is actually one of the best in the book. So I, I dare to propose that. I don't like self-advertisement, but I think because it looks at different religious traditions <coughs> in science, it does perhaps bring a rather broader perspective than just looking at examples from either within Islam or within Judaism or within the Christian tradition. Right. Uh, and the second question that I had uh, before we wrapped up was, what advice would you give to academics who are, first of all, generally interested in science and religion, number one, but um, more particularly in the history? How would you, what would you advise to, to academics interested in that particular territory? Well, uh, we've mentioned Peter Harrison once or twice. I mean, he has now written at least three um, outstanding books on the history of science and religion. And, and I think he, he is certainly a figure I would pick out as needing very special attention. Um, I don't know, again, whether I dare mention my own book, which you kindly oh. referred to. Um, yeah. Incidentally, you, you said it was new in 2014, or you implied that. Actually, that was a new edition of a book that was published in 1991. Oh. So that's been around uh, for quite a long time. The, the new Canto Classics edition is much nicer because although it's thicker, um, the print is much easier to read. I think for somebody wanting a, a sense of how fascinating and rich and complex the history of the relations between science and religion are, I think that book does still have a certain value, even though I dare to say it myself. Um, but there are many, many other people writing excellent stuff. On the Victorian period, um, the work of James Moore, particularly on, on Darwin, um, Bernard Lightman, who works at York University in, in Toronto. He's written some wonderful stuff on uh, the late 19th century popularization of, of science and the way that 
uh, reflects all kinds of values, some of which would come from religion. Books by David Livingstone um, from Queen's University Belfast. I strongly recommend his work because he emphasizes something that any professional historian would recognize, which is the importance of looking at local contexts mm. when you are trying to study the controversies that boil up uh, in science and religion. And, and he's really uh, an excellent guide to that localization. Um, he, he, he kind of brings the insights of a cultural geographer to bear on the study of, of these issues. Why was it that Presbyterians in, shall we say, Princeton reacted to Darwin on the whole rather differently from Presbyterians in Belfast, differently again from Presbyterians in New Zealand? You've got to look at local contexts if you're going to grasp the, the subtleties. That's just a few off the top of my head. What about well, Peter Beller? Well, indeed, and and I think Peter's work um, has been exceptional. He he has a a book, as as I'm sure you know. Well, many on the history of evolution itself, um, and the way Darwin's ideas were. Um, what I was going to say was the way they were received. But of course, one of his very interesting points in his early work was that although the concept of evolution, as Darwin formulated it, uh, became widely accepted, certainly within the scientific community by the end of the 19th century, Darwin's specific mechanism of natural selection remained controversial for a much longer period and, and arguably until, uh, well, some would say, and, until the 1930s. So Peter's work on the history of evolutionary theory um, has been seminal. But he wrote also a, a very fine book on uh, the reconciliation of science and religion, particularly in the English and American worlds around the 1920s and 30s, which was interesting because he looked at figures outside the biological world. He looked at those working in the mathematical and physical sciences who were trying to build bridges um, between the latest physical science and the religious values of the time. So I rate Peter's work very highly. Um, and you could mention half a dozen other names and I would have to say the same because there really is a lot of excellent work now. Right, right. Um, we have a, a couple of questions here, uh, Professor John. Do you mind if I throw some your way? Please do. Right, um, here we have Afam who's asking, um, even literature on philosophy or history of science you know, e.g. the very short introductions from Oxford, they see history of science as a very much Euro-American um, trajectory. So he, he says in particular, it kind of jumps from Aristotle to Galileo without like anything in between, right? So why why is it done that way? Any particular reason? Well, sad to say, I think one particular reason may simply be a question of facility uh, with languages. Um, because to really get to grips with the wonderful work that was done by the Islamic philosophers in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, uh, obviously one does ideally need a knowledge of the, the Arabic um, in which that scientific work was presented. Uh, so I think there is a linguistic um, attitude. There's a cultural thing, I think, why um, the contribution of, of some of the great Islamic scientists, if we just use that word anachronistically for a moment, um, why some of that work gets neglected, and that is a cultural uh, point. It's not a comfortable one to make, but I think just um, one has to acknowledge that different religious traditions have a way of claiming that their own religious tradition has a special relationship with science. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of tribal attitude, if one could call it that, does manifest itself in, in various ways. Um, so I think that 
there are reasons why we don't know so much about that gap, but there are nevertheless many expert historians around the world who have specialized in the history of um, what we might call the, the more medieval period. And, and they have shown that it's not a period of the dark ages. It's a period of great fertility in thinking, certainly in a more metaphysical and theological way uh, about science, but nevertheless, in, in, in a very crucial way. So there's a lot there still to dig out. And, and, and I think it's, it, it's a, it is a source of sadness that we have simply ignored that long period and treated it uh, as a period when virtually no innovative scientific work was done. Right. right. I hope that answers your question. Um, this is a question, it's, 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 this is a technical one. So how important was Descartes in creating a rift between religion and science? And to what extent did Occam's nominalism give rise to a loosening of religious thinking? So I think particularly in the second question, I remember Gavin Hyman, he made a similar point in his book about um, uh, Occam's uh, um, nominalism leading to some kind of eternal theological conflict that led to some kind of modern atheism, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, you would know better than me on this matter. I think the answer to the second one um, is not going to be easy. One of the reasons is that Occam is sometimes wheeled out as a crucial thinker for the development of what is sometimes called a voluntarist element in theology, namely a, a theology that emphasizes the omnipotent freedom of God's will. And so one looks at the world as a world that is full of contingency. It's a world that God could have made differently from the way he has made it. Um, and that view was obviously in some kind of tension with the view that there is some kind of necessity in the way God made the world, because it had in Leibniz's famous phrase, it had to be the best of all possible worlds, which puts kind of rational constraints on what the world must be like. So there has been the argument that that voluntarism, which you can trace back in some measure to Occam, um, that did actually liberate the study of nature from, as it were, an armchair rationalist kind of, of enterprise, um, exemplified in the minds of more radical thinkers by scholastic Catholic theology, um, liberating that and ensuring that more empirical methods were brought to bear in discovering which of the many possible worlds this voluntary voluntarist agent, namely God, had actually chosen to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the, the relationship between Occam and modern rationalist thought is, is a little bit difficult to pin down. I, I would see quite a lot of other possible interpretations there. On the Descartes question, um, it's perhaps too easy to see in Descartes the makings of a of a critical rift between uh, science and religion. One can see exactly how it, that case can be made because we associate Descartes with the mechanization of the natural world where nature gets its own autonomy. And the only thing in the, in the universe that is not mechanical is the human mind um, and the soul. And so the, the life of the spirit, as it were, uh, gets almost detached from the material world that one sees in, in all Descartes' mechanistic analogies for the workings of nature. But a closer reading of Descartes I does, does, I think, generate uh, alternative perspectives. Uh, he, he does 
emphasize, I think, a view of creation whereby God is constantly recreating the world from one moment to the next. It's, it's not a God who's created the machine and then walked away. It, it's a God who does still uphold the creation of, of the world. And when, when Descartes writes on what we would call uh, the principle of, of inertia, uh, he's very keen to explain why it is that motion in a straight line is conserved. Um, and it's conserved because mo motion is upheld, it's sustained by God. And the simplest kind of motion for Descartes is motion in a straight line. And so from that, he actually deduces, if you like, from the theology, he actually deduces something that bears some resemblance uh, to Newton's first law of motion, the, the law we call the principle of, of inertia. So one has to look at Descartes very carefully. He produces a mechanistic view of the world, which liberal thinkers, particularly in the 18th century, were able to exploit to suggest that the world is just an autonomous machine. Mm -hmm. Science has the task of simply determining how that machine works. Mm -hmm. But when the world is a machine, and this is the last point, um, when, when one asks how it is that these machines constitute the world, of course, the thing about machines is that they don't make themselves. Uh, there's never been a machine, to my knowledge, that has ever made itself. And so a mechanistic view of nature can be turned to theological advantage. Um, and the, the beautiful and intricate mechanisms of nature, which Descartes describes in, in some way, um, those intricate designs in nature actually testify to there having been some kind of transcendent power with intelligence who had made this particular world. Mm -hmm. How you envisaged the activity of that God within nature, that's a much broader and a much more tricky question. But it's a question on which almost every natural philosopher had his own view. Right. I would love uh, to have uh, said his or her own view. There were female natural philosophers, but sadly not so many. Right. Uh, so there you have it. Um, Hamid, let me know if, if we answer your question or not. But uh, Professor John, thank you so much for giving us your precious time. I know you're very busy with you got a lot of projects up in the air. I'm sure we benefit a lot from your uh, discussion. I just wanted to ask, um, are you okay with people messaging you or emailing you later on if they, in case they have any follow-up questions? By all means, of course, it would be a pleasure. Excellent. So, guys, what I've done is I've put in uh, Professor John's academia link so you can see all his publications there, some of the excellent work that he's doing. Uh, but definitely check out, um, uh, I, I know he said it's the 1991 publication, but the 2014 publication, um, that is a really, really good book. It's actually a, a staple book on the history of science and religion. We had to study it as well. So I strongly recommend that. In academia as well, you can also find Professor John's contact details, so you can email him anytime, right? Um, thank you so much for coming on the show, Professor John. Uh, I hope to have you again at some point soon, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Thank you. Take it easy, guys, and for a wonderful session. Thank you, Professor John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.